My name's Kirsten Pilati. I'm the very proud CEO of Breast Cancer Network Australia. So welcome to everyone. And before we begin tonight, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I meet tonight, and that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I particularly want to thank elders past and present and really acknowledge the leaders of today who are providing and shouldering so much important information and uh, lessons for all of us to take into this great network that we are part of. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, tonight is all about persistent pain. And as I said, uh, it is very clear that there is a need in our network. I want to welcome all of those of you who are diagnosed with not only early breast cancer or DCIS, but also those living with metastatic breast cancer. It is awesome to have you here. A couple of housekeeping rule, uh, housekeeping information. We received well over 150 uh, messages and questions prior to this event, but it doesn't mean that you don't need to stop. So tonight, we really encourage you to connect with each other in the chat, but also to continue to send through questions to us as we will have a Q&A in the uh, session afterwards. Tonight, we will be looking at not only the physical treatments uh, and side effects, but also importantly, the emotional impact that pain has. And also for many people, that is not just because of their breast cancer, but maybe because of some of their comorbidities of, um, of their lives. So I am so thrilled. I want to get straight into the session tonight. Please remember to connect with each other through the chat and also send through any questions that you may have. As many people may know, the very important part of our network is about hearing from the lived experiences of those diagnosed with breast cancer. And tonight, I am so thrilled that we have one of our consumer representatives here to share her experience. And Nav certainly has a story to tell, but she's probably best placed to share it herself. So Nav, Please introduce yourself and welcome to tonight's webcast. Thanks, KP. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Navina, as um, as KP mentioned, and I'm a consumer representative with BCNA. Before my cancer, you know, took me down this path, I used to be an executive with a health insurer when I got diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. I got diagnosed with triple negative um, for which, um, you know, surgery, chemo and radiotherapy were the uh, treatment options at the time. And pre-cancer, I had a, uh, I still do, I guess, have a high tolerance for pain. And I never used to want to take pain medications. And I know a lot of the questions and comments that were made were, were similar to that. Um, but I've changed my mind over time and I'll explain why. Um, when I underwent the treatment, um, I, I discovered um, through that process and even after that there's kind of two types of pain. Um, one for me was event-based or treatment-based and the other one's chronic. Um, so with the surgery that I underwent, which was a lumpectomy and axillary clearance, um, I ended up with cording and scar tissue. Um, and I know, again, some of you mentioned that, and it was very painful. I had really uh, bad issues with my arm. I couldn't raise my arm past my shoulder. And um, the only way I could deal with it was to go and see a, a specialist physio, uh, a lymphedema physio in my case, uh, who had to massage and break the scar tissue and give me more exercises because, you know, the... The day I left hospital post-surgery, a physio came and saw me and gave me a lift, list of exercises, but said to me, do them, but don't push yourself if, if it hurts. Um, and because it hurt, I didn't push myself. And that led to the problem um, with the um, with the cording uh, because it, uh, it took over, basically. Um, I couldn't break it. I couldn't move it. Um, and so my breast care nurse had said to me, go and see a lymphedema physio, uh, which is what I did and, and uh, managed to uh, deal with it. Then we got to the chemotherapy and, you know, you get some of the joint pain and the pins and needles. Um, I had AC, four rounds of uh, anthocycline or the red devil and 12 rounds of Taxol. And during the Taxol process, I started getting pins and needles, but I think because I have a high tolerance for pain, um, 
kind of mastered a little, little bit and I had a chat with my oncologist and she had asked me uh, how bad is it and I said I think it's around about 15 percent of the time because I calculated in my brain going oh, this many days uh, this many minutes every day um, and so on uh, I laugh at myself now thinking about it um, and because it seemed like a low impact side effect we decided to complete the uh, the full treatment cycle and then I had uh, radiotherapy for 30 rounds and I don't know about you guys, but, you know, it feels like the last day of school, you know, you walk out the door and you feel like you have to go on into this big world and figure out life for yourself. Um, but what happened at that point and going forward from that point was I had the joint pain and I thought, OK, you know, it might go away, um, I, you know, hopefully soon. Um, and. I ended up going to like a breast rehab program that the Epworth ran here in Melbourne and had a chat to a doctor then. And they said, oh, how long since you finished treatment? And I said, oh, about three months. And they said, oh, it usually should go away about now. Um, but if it doesn't go away by the time it's six months, it might be permanent. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want that to happen. Uh, and they put me on Lyrica at that time. And I was also taking Panadol. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the Lyrica was for the neuropathy because I was getting more pins and needles. And I used to call it, it was felt like a Christmas tree being lit up with lights. You know, you'd feel this kind of tingling all over your body. Um, and I also had um, the sensation of having burnt my fingers and also ants biting me. So I'd be walking along and suddenly I'd slap my leg because I'd think of, I've been bitten by an ant and there'd be nothing there. Uh, so it was kind of a bit, um, uh, you know, uh, challenging, I said, I guess you can use. Um, and anyway, so, you know, another three months passed and I'd hit the six month point. And I went for a checkup with my uh, oncologist and I limped into her office and she said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I hurt everywhere. And this is the thing you learn with cancer and in a post-cancer life that once upon a time you'd go to a doctor and they'd calm you down because you'd be like, I'm worried about this. With cancer, when you go and see your doctors and you say, I'm worried about this, they almost have a bigger freak out than you do because they're worried that the cancer's come back. And that's what happened with my oncologist. She went, oh my God, that's good. Send me for a bunch of scans, um, sent me to a rheumatologist, started me on different pain medications. So, you know, it was a bit of a pill testing regime of starting with tramadol and then oxy and I had fentanyl I had MS contin none of them worked the fentanyl I ended up being allergic to so I ended up on steroids and that coincided with the time I went to see a rheumatologist um, and he asked me did the steroids help and I said no and he said basically then it's not rheumatological uh, but he explained to me a process that happens with uh, nerve pain and chronic pain and said um, it's called amplification and recruitment um, and the way he explained it to me is that the nerves that are damaged start shouting really loudly and your brain kind of gets caught up in that and then the damaged nerves go and talk to the good nerves and say aren't you a bit unwell as well and they go yeah I think so so you end up with this all, all over the body feeling of pain some of which is possibly from the taxol damage, but some of it's from this other stuff where the body's got stuck in this pain loop. Um, she ran out of ideas uh, of how to deal with it and sent me to pain rehab, um, where they kind of tried to teach me other techniques other than medications and sleep, because I was using sleep at the time as, as a way of breaking through the pain. Uh, because it would accelerate uh, as I got more and more active during the day and then I would break it with sleep and then um, it's the same thing, the same cycle would persist. And um, the pain rehab guys, I had a physio and an OT who, and a psychologist also who was trying to uh, help me with my sleep because the pain was affecting uh, my sleep as well. And some of the tips they gave me was around stretching. So I would, you know, they would, I would, I would stretch my hips out and, um, and so on. They gave me a spiky ball. It's like a little plastic thing with spikes on it. And they taught me how to rub. 
I, I looked like a bear in a forest, like rubbing up against a tree. And I'd use a spiky ball on my pain points, sometimes even in the car, because when you're sitting still for so long, it would hurt a lot. And so I would sit there and, you know, basically rub it against this car seat. Um, they also taught me about um, that, that the principle of motion is lotion. Because one of the things you stop doing is because it hurts, you don't move. And they kind of broke that by saying, you know, if you don't move, it gets worse. So you have to keep moving because it'll help with the with the joints and the joint movement. And I still think of that when I kind of get into that headspace of, oh, man, it hurts. And I don't feel like doing anything. And I go, no, no, motion is motion. Keep going. Um, and... Um, I've mentioned this in previous webcasts around using uh, raw rice to confuse the stimuli on your hands and your feet. So you put it in and because the, the grains of rice are small, they move around your hand uh, or your feet. Um, but of course you can't walk around with bags of rice on your hand and feet all the time, but I can use it kind of just to break, if it's getting, break through the pain, if it's getting really bad. Um, exercise, that was a big one. And because they told me motion was lotion and to keep uh, fit and, you know, keep doing exercises, uh, I decided to go and learn swimming. Actually, I never uh, knew how to swim because I figured that um, gravity based exercise was really painful on my joints. But swimming actually really helps because it, you know, you're lighter in the water and you're getting fit, but it's kind of taking the pressure off your joints. And um the endorphins I got from that and the thrill from learning this new skill set gave me the motivation to keep active in spite of the pain. And you sort of had to learn these, um, these techniques of how to live with your pain, um, but make the most of it. It's a really weird headspace that you have to get into. Um, anyway, the, the pain rehab guys, basically added on a couple of drugs, um, which was Pelexi and Geloxetine, uh, and they ran out of ideas. So then they sent me to a pain specialist uh, and the pain specialist who I'm still with, um, and I'm talking about now eight years post-treatment, um, kind of looked at my combination of medications where I was on Proxen, um, for, which is an anti-inflammatory, um, I was on Polexia, I was on Geloxid, I was still on Lyrica at that time, but we swapped it out because I was gaining fluid um, on my body and, and, and having issues with weight gain, which Lyrica can cause apparently. So I went on to Gabapentin uh, and he added in a couple of other ones, including um, melatonin, which was to help with the sleep and nortriptyline, which as a combination with all the other drugs is um, kind of works also to alleviate the pain. And um, over time I had to drop the proxen because you can't be on anti-inflammatories um, in the long term. It's not good for your body. And so I'm still on all the other medications. But the main thing I learned through all of this, and initially I was in the headspace of denial and grief. And you go from you know, you expect when you start the cancer treatment process, you think, oh, I'll take a year out of my life, do that and go back to my old life and my old body. And you realize after you finished all of that, that that doesn't happen. And but there's this pain and you go, well, you know, I've got to get rid of the pain because I accept having pain while I'm going through a treatment process. But what's all this? I finished the treatment and I'm still going through it. So um I fought that, I fought the pain for a long time. Um, and which was why I was like, okay, hit me with the next drug and let's try something different. And I can't, this can't be my life. And then I had a chat with my pain specialist one day and um, he started talking about ketamine infusions and I'm like, horse tranquilizer, I'm like, what the heck? Um, and he said, and I kind of went, oh, okay, so if I have that, and he goes, if you tolerate it, I said, can I drop all the other pain medications? He goes, no. And he, I said, will it be a one-off? And he said, no. And that was the moment I went, I'm done. I'm done being a guinea pig. I just have to learn that this is going to be my life and I have to move on. And because everybody asks you up until that point, where's the pain, how bad's the pain? And you're constantly thinking about the pain. Um, you feel it. 
And the moment I accepted it and decided I was just going to go live my life and deal with any pain spikes, I decided that distraction was my best way of doing it. I stopped it. The pain is there, but I stopped focusing on it. And, and what it does is I call it, it's like a refrigerator hum. You know, you first hear it and it bugs you, but then over time you stop hearing it unless it gets louder. And I look at my chronic pain in that way. You know, I go, well, I'm going along, there's a spike and you go, Ooh, that's a spike settle. If the spike settles, I go, it's probably because I've done, you know, some activity or something that's caused it to spike. Um, and then it goes back to being that steady state. It's always there, but it doesn't, you just kind of like start ignoring it a little bit. Um, I remember some questions around how do you know if there's nothing else underlying and should I be worried? The way I look at it is um, if there's a spike above my baseline pain, um, I focus on it and go, is it going away? And if it doesn't go away, then I go and get it investigated. And it's the same, I guess, if you don't have pain, you need, when you don't have pain and you have a spike, you go, what's that? Um, the other thing um, I wanted to mention was about the reluctance to take medication. And I was in that headspace for quite a while, but I've realized for myself that taking the pain medication brings the pain down to a manageable level. And I can then get on and be active and have some semblance of a life as opposed to constantly being stuck in that pain cycle, my brain kind of going, there's pain everywhere. It actually helps your brain calm down and it helps you calibrate where your pain is and understand what your baseline is, because then you can understand where your problems are, uh, are coming from. And the last thing uh, before I hand back to KP is um, that it's a weird thing. You run away from pain and that's the human response. You go, okay, there's pain and I shouldn't be doing things because it's causing pain. I started learning to lean into the pain and it's a weird headspace again, because you go, what? Um, but because you can't fear your life anymore, you can't fear activity in general. I consider it, um, it's a bit like if you start exercising after you haven't been exercising for a long time and you get that muscle soreness and stuff, but you're willing to accept that because you know you'll move past it and get fit. I kind of look at chronic pain a little bit like that because I go, if I lean into it, then I win and I don't let the pain win. And it kind of feels good in a strange way, especially when you're in a headspace of, God, my life sucks and God, the chronic pain's hard and you know, is it ever going to go away? And why me? And all of that sort of stuff. I, I look at it as like, almost like that's a opponent that I'm going to be fighting against. And sometimes I have some wins and it makes me feel good. So um, I hope that has helped um, some of you with understanding um, how I deal with pain anyway, and what options you have. Um, thanks, KP. Thanks for the opportunity to share my story. So Nav, you can't see the chitter chat that's going on, but I can. And um, there are people saying that they've learned more in this 15 minutes in the last four years in trying to talk to trading teams. And I think it goes to the very heart of our network around the gift that those people who have a lived experience can pass on to others. So what a contribution you've made. And I already know there's going to be lots of questions coming through um, to you, but thank you for really opening up yourself and allowing all of us to learn from your experience. Uh, so okay. keep the connections coming online. It's really special to watch people um, connecting and sharing their own experiences as well. So we're now going to um, move to hear from Professor Paul Glair and um Paul is a pain medicine specialist and how um, incredible is it that we get to hear from such an expert here with us? So, Paul, I'd love you to introduce yourself and um, I know that you're going to pass on a wealth of information and really help to answer the hundreds of questions we received prior to, uh, to, this, um, to this webcast, but no pressure. No, well... Uh... Thanks very much, and thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to 
people in the network. And I've got to say, I, I don't really have much to say now because Nadine has already said, <laughs> said it all. And, and um, yeah, I learned from her as well. But pro probably what I'll do is say some stuff to probably back up some of the things that she said. But yeah, no, I, I, I could stop now, <laughs> basically. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a pain specialist. Uh, I, I do clinical work at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. I got interested in cancer pain management 25 years ago when at the start of my career. And fortunately, during that time, the whole cancer kind of landscape's changed and much more of it now is about managing um, painful complications of cancer treatment rather than cancer pain itself. Just also add by introduction that my poor old mum died of breast cancer about five years ago. She was 86, but uh, she didn't really have that much pain. But a problem was that um, she also had a lot of arthritis and it made it very difficult. The, the rheumatologist did this bone scan and was shocked that there was this metastatic breast cancer there. So, you know, it kind of delayed that being picked up and was um, not such a good thing. But anyway... Um, yeah, you know, pain and pain and cancer is a complicated situation. Any, anyway, yeah, like, like I said, I, I, I'd probably just say some facts to kind of back up what and support what Navina was saying. And yeah, I think the first thing is like when Navina was talking about changing your headspace, this whole thing of understanding the difference between acute pain and chronic or persistent pain and chronic, meaning that it's been there for a long time, not chronic in the, in that kind of common sense of, oh, it's very, you know, distressing or whatever. Um, and, you know, like acute pain is there to serve a warning that there's tissue damage and you've got to find the cause and remove it. And 80 or 90% of the time, whether whether it's a tumour, whether you've broken your arm, whether you sprain your ankle, 80 or 90% of people, it gets better in a short, predictable period of time. It's chronic pain when it persists beyond the time that it should have taken for the problem to heal up. And that's very different because, um, like Naveen was saying, it's not so much where the pain is, but how you feel and think about it, that impact on it, how it's impacting on what you're doing doesn't really serve a purpose. It's just a source of suffering. And, you know, we really need to address all those other things. And like she said, we don't, you know, in some people there may be a problem going on, but a lot of the time it's this kind of amplification and recruitment that she talked about. I'll talk about that a little bit more briefly. It's a complicated problem that, or, you know, concept that's difficult to explain a bit. But like she said, it got to really... You know, if you really want to make progress, you've got to move away from seeking relief of the pain and kind of accepting it and looking at how you can improve your functioning and get back to living a normal life, even though there's some pain there. So I, I talk about that a bit more. Um, and yeah, so um, like she said, you know, um, when you've got this chronic pain, it does cause a number of problems. So you know, it hurts to move, you're worried that there might be more, you're doing more damage or there's a serious problem. So you tend to lie down and rest a lot and you become deconditioned, you can put on weight, you start having these unhelpful thoughts and beliefs like, well, what if it gets worse? Why can't they fix me? How will I keep going? And that makes people anxious and depressed and frustrated and angry and not sleeping. They and again, as Navina said, taking a lot of medications that has side effects and it's masking what's really going on. And yeah, you, you know, you completely lose your confidence to function while you're in pain and you become dependent on others. You can't fulfill your roles because of stress in the family, financial stress, and et cetera. And then, you know, this, I guess, this lingering issue, which I think must be hard to overcome. Like, so what if it means the cancer's come back and what's all the implications of that? So a lot of reasons to have a lot of unhelpful thoughts and beliefs when you're in chronic pain after cancer treatment. And you really need to address all these issues, not just order more scans and blood tests and so on. Um, yeah, and other thing I just talk about is access to pain management for people who've completed cancer treatment. And it's a problem everywhere. Uh, earlier this year, in, or earlier last year, you should say about a year ago in the Journal of Oncology Practice, 
they published a survey done at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina, surveying oncologists and palliative care doctors and GPs at that center about what, you know, what do they think about or their perspectives on pain in uh, people who've had cancer treatment. And yeah, we, you know, they really weren't sure how much of a problem it is. They weren't sure what to do about it. They weren't trained in it. They didn't know if it was their responsibility to do anything about it. They didn't know who to refer to. So, you know, as, as a result, and we see it in Australia that only 5% of people who go to a public hospital pain clinic anyway have got cancer-related pain. And um, so I guess GPs and, on, and uh, oncologists are trying to manage it, but perhaps not doing such a good job of it because of these silos. People aren't, unlike Navina, a lot of people aren't working out how to get access to pain rehab and pain specialists. As a pain specialist, um, most of them aren't like me with an interest in cancer pain. There are a few. Um, I know people at Peter Mac, for example, there in Melbourne are interested in it and so on. But most pain specialists call themselves transdiagnostic. And, and in a way, it's true. It doesn't really matter what the underlying disease was. We approach chronic pain much the same way. To get to see a pain medical pain specialist, you need a GP referral, whether that's a private pain specialist or in a public hospital. Um, but for chronic pain, really needs a multidisciplinary team, including psychologists and physiotherapists. And we'll hear from Charlotte shortly. Um, and in the community, I know that about 15 to 20% of physiotherapists around where I work in private practice say they've got expertise in pain management and about a third of psychologists say they've got expertise in pain management. So you can get it in the community, but if it, if the pain's a big problem, probably a multidisciplinary um, pain clinic and a public hospital is what you really need. Um, so we did this survey last year. It's currently under review at the Journal of Cancer Survivorship. We... It, this time last year, we interviewed 360 people in the waiting room of Northern Sydney Cancer Centre. Uh, more than a quarter had breast cancer. 50% of these, a uh, bit more females, you know, people like moving towards retirement on average. Two thirds of them were still having some kind of cancer treatment, but half of them thought they were cured or at least in remission and maybe on like, you know, long term maintenance treatment. Uh, only so only about 17 percent of them said that they had chronic pain being there more than three months and that's very similar to the general population and two and you know two-thirds of them actually blamed it on pre-existing chronic pain back pain arthritis migraine etc one third of them uh, so there were there were about uh 12 percent who said they had chronic cancer pain of the remaining 85%, two thirds were unrelated and one third were cancer treatment related pain. Breast cancer were common there, hematology, malignancies, and um, I think prostate was the other one. And um, just looking at those people who had cancer treatment related pain, like 60% had had pain for less than two years and only 20% of it had it for more than five years. So it does, does unlike Navina, it does seem to eventually go away for a lot of people. And with all modalities of treatment, like Navina was saying, could cause it. But the thing was that two-thirds of those people said that their pain was significantly interfering with their functioning. And that's two-thirds of people with pain. And so it was like more than 10% of the people in the waiting room had high-impact chronic pain. It was... Um, causing interference and distress. And those people um, are more likely to have these unhelpful thoughts and beliefs. So if you've got chronic pain, but it's not interfering too much, you're probably coping with it pretty well. If it's interfering a lot, then these unhelpful thoughts and beliefs are probably um, interfering with how you're functioning. A um, lot, lot of information on this slide, just in terms of what the pregnancy and prognosis of it is. This is a bit of an older study from Aberdeen in Scotland. But I think it's pretty definitive. They, they There were like nearly 800 women had breast cancer surgery between 1990 and 1995 because of the NHS system. They could track them. They could identify them all. 
about half, then in 1996, they contacted them, about half of them agreed to complete their survey and 43% reported some pain on average three years after their surgery. Uh, they described it, but it was only interfering in function in about a quarter. So, um, you know, only about, what is about 40 or 50 of them had really bad pain. So it seems like a pretty mild. Then um, what they reported in 2005 when they followed them up nine years afterwards and still, so only about 15% were still complaining of pain and it was less bothersome than it had been before. Many had resolved and the ones who still had it, their quality of life wasn't as bad and their physical functioning was much better. So it seems like does gradually go away and it does have less of an impact, but, you know, nine years is a long time to be having to live with it. Um, like, you know, this thing about amplification and recruitment. So why am I still getting pain more than five years after treatment? So, you know, it was Descartes, the philosopher back in 1644, who really helped us understand about pain. It was really, it was about like pain could be within the body rather than coming from God as a, renaissance philosopher but you know nothing's really changed until the last say 50 years with understanding pain we've still thought there's something like his diagram of a boy burning his foot sending a message to the brain and we've got to remove the fire from the foot but you know um what and this research are going on all the time and with modern you know technology we can understand this stuff better and better but there can still be issues going on. So probably radiation therapy and surgery and chemo causes this chronic inflammation. It takes a long time to die down. Damaged nerves take a long time to recover. And then this kind of concept of application and recruitment, the general term is now central sensitization and seems like the wiring in the spinal cord gets affected. And then where it goes to in the brain changes as well. Instead of initially going into the part of the brain that says like it's in my foot and it hurts a lot, goes into the emotional part of the brain and gets into these learning circuits and goes round and round and round. So, you know, we do kind of understand more scientifically why pain becomes chronic in some people. And then, you know, like, like I've been saying, and uh, Navina said, there's all this stuff going on in your head. What, you know, if doctors are telling you, what your family and friends are telling you, what you've learned yourself in your life, and that may be not very helpful. So, you know, should I worry? Navina talked about this. I mean, to me, when if I see a, a lady who's got chronic pain after breast, breast cancer, obviously these red, red flags like, is that, you know, serious metastatic disease? Are they, are they getting progressive headaches? Is it, you know, serious back pain that's progressing and they're getting weakness? Is it like... Um, hip pain and is there any other evidence that the cancer is active? I think this other issue of whether there's local recurrence, I think probably not as medically serious, but like big implications for the, the person if they've got local recurrence. But I, I would say that, you know, uh, once the history is well understood and the oncologist has ordered all the imaging, you know, I think you can probably be pretty confident to move away from that it could be actually cancer. So, I mean, I rarely order new imaging because the oncologists usually got an imaging plan in mind and they, they I find they generally don't like someone else kind of interfering with that. And they, they say to me, well, you ordered the MRI, you tell them, you know, why there's disease there. <laughs> I didn't order it. But, you know, we, we do sometimes, it, more a bit like with my mum's case, um, we do order tests on somebody. It turns out that, you know, their pain's worse because, you know, now they've got cancer and we re refer them to oncology. But in, in the assessment, you know, we want to understand, I want to understand what's been tried, what helped, what didn't help, how come, how they've got to the pain clinic, what are their goals, are they still fixated on pain relief or are they looking to move on and manage, accept it and manage it better? What are they expecting? Are they wanting drugs or injections or surgery or integrated medicine? And, you know, if if uh, we, we get them to fill out these questionnaires and if we're picking up a lot of disability and distress, then, you know, really looking into, you know, uh, how open are they to start to address these psychosocial factors? I think someone in one of the previous questions said, 
you know, is the pain or they've been told the pain psychological. I mean, I would hardly say that pain's ever purely psychological. It's more that uh, psychological factors, you know, affecting the, the way the the pain, the real pain is is experiencing a person and um, how they're coping with it. So, you know, th there may be treatment options to take the pain away. And like Naveen is saying, you can try different drugs like the Cymbalta, medicinal cannabis, integrative things like um, techniques. And it seems like sometimes there are these blocks. I mean, one thing I've learned from this is I, I'd never heard of this iron bra syndrome. And when I, I Googled it, it seems that uh, intercostal brachial nerve block can often reduce it, doesn't seem to get rid of it, but can reduce it. And I think, you know, so there may be roles for that kind of thing. Um, and then whether there are more fancy things like spinal cord stimulators, et cetera. I formerly worked at Memorial St. Kettering, New York. My, there are colleagues there who are looking at putting in stimulators on peripheral nerves rather than in the spinal cord, et cetera, but not sure if that's available in this country or not. Uh, and, and, you know, there is there is randomised controlled trial data that duloxetine is effective for chemotherapy-induced painful peripheral neuropathy. It's an old study now, but it showed that it um, the number of people who got like a 20% reduction in their pain uh, was 18% with placebo and double that with the drug and giving a number needed to treat of six. So it doesn't help everybody, but it can be helpful. And I, um, I think I've got a couple of minutes left. I want to finish up talking about the other option, which is the pain rehab or what I would call teaching pain coping skill or pain coping skills training, um, like the pain rehab people seem to have done for Navina. I know Charlotte's going to talk about this, but just got two or three slides on this. So, you know, 95% of people who come to the pain clinic don't have cancer or cancer treatment related pain. And, you know, it's more about getting them to also accept that hurt doesn't equal harm and that they can learn to cope with their pain differently, even though they've been living with it and doing what they can. There are some other techniques that our psychologists and physios can treat them. Uh, question is, um, can you teach this to people who are cancer survivors? And um, so this is really my uh, second last slide. So I, this is also in review at a journal called Pain Medicine. This is looking at 23 cancer survivors who participated in our group pain self-management programs alongside men and women with other, might be men with lung who are lung cancer survivors, but mostly men and women with chronic back pain and migraine and arthritis and that kind of stuff. And eight of them had breast cancer some of them, they were they were cancer survivors. About half of them had unrelated chronic pain. The other half had cancer treatment related pain. And what, what I'm trying to show there that everything improved during the program. The green line is below, is like, you know, in normal range for the scores. Above the red line is severe. So, um, and the, the the kind of number of people on opioids went down, the dose went down, but mild to moderate, or, or sorry, you know, moderate levels of pain and depression and not coping improved after the program and continued to be improved on average three months after follow-up. So, uh, so my take-home messages uh, would be chronic pain is a real problem for some survivors. I think it's been a bit overshadowed by other symptoms like chemo brain and fatigue. And I think the number of people at this uh, at this seminar indicates what a big problem it is. I think it's more common in the first few years if it's from treatment, but it gradually resolves for most people. Um, ongoing tissue damage might be playing a role, but it, uh, there might not be a lot that can be done about that. Um, Drugs, interventions, integrative therapies can reduce pain a bit, but I think if it's impacting a lot on your functioning, whether that's physical functioning or social and emotional functioning, these psychosocial factors are probably contributing and that's really where a pain clinic can come in. And like I just said on the previous slide, survivors who do make it to our clinic and learn these strategies can improve a lot and they don't have to do it in a specified group. 
and they but they need to keep practicing the techniques. And I think go, going home, the big issue is for a lot of people is how do you get access? You know, how do you convince the GP, the oncologist to refer you? Or even if they're willing, you might live a long way away. It's just not feasible to do it. And I think delivering this in a scalable way is uh, my research interest. So happy to talk about that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you um, so much, Paul. And uh, just like Nav, there is a lot of discussion online and I can assure you there's plenty of questions coming through uh, for you. So uh, thank you so much. I think we um, there is so much we need to do, but even what I'm reading online, just to have a clinician actually acknowledge the pain uh, is a very big step forward that which uh, it seems we've still got a bit of a way to go. So that is why it is the perfect segue to Dr. Charlotte Topman, who is really going to talk about um, the emotional impact of um, the pain and the persistent pain and give us some practical tips on how we can uh, make a way forward and, as Nav said, lean into it um, and try and manage it as best we can. So, uh, Charlotte, welcome. Thanks, KP. I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name's Dr. Charlotte Topman. I am a psycho-oncologist, which means I'm a, a clinical psychologist who specialises in cancer-related distress. I'm not a, a clinical psychologist who specialises in chronic pain, and so I certainly see a lot of my cancer clients um, who deal with persistent pain, and I treat them, and I guess I have some, you know, level of understanding and knowledge from that basis, but I am not a pain specialist per se. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight from the perspectives of the theory, theory of psycho-oncology, from my clinical practice and from my personal experience. I um, work in private practice, but I've also been through a breast cancer experience. I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer in 2018, and I live with a degree of persistent pain. And it's interesting when I was thinking about introducing myself and disclosing the fact that I do live with um, this thing called iron bra syndrome, which Paul mentioned just before, as a result of my double mastectomy, I felt a bit uncomfortable about even saying that because I feel a bit embarrassed. And I think sometimes that's how people feel. They feel a bit almost em embarrassed or ashamed. They don't want to complain. Maybe they don't want to um, be seen as, you know, still dealing with that thing so many years later. Um, pain does not have a good reputation. People don't like hearing about pain. People don't like pain. They don't like talking about pain. And I thought it was really interesting that even in myself, and I deal with this stuff all the time, I feel a bit uncomfortable even about even acknowledging it. Living with persistent or chronic pain brings up a whole lot of psychological, emotional responses, and these include but not, are not limited to anxiety, anger, feelings of loss, a sense of injustice, like it's not fair, and emotional isolation, which is where we can feel like we're going through something really rather intense that's lasting a really long time, but the people around us don't get it. And the reason they often don't get it is because they haven't been through it themselves, but also because people take in information through their eyes. And if we look kind of okay, you know, we're not in our pyjamas, we're not back from chemo with our hair loss, we're back at work, we might be parenting or having caring responsibilities, living life. We look like we're okay, so people assume we're okay. And because a lot of people do continue to live functional lives, even with persistent or chronic pain, that can be misleading. And that can leave people feeling really isolated. Persistent pain is invisible. You can't see it. It's isolating from your loved ones, but it can be isolating even from people like your medical team. Because again, if you're looking and sounding okay, we can feel very isolated and we can feel invalidated. We can go to our medical teams. We can go to people that we know care about us and we can risk talking about chronic or persistent pain. And we can often see people's eyes glaze over or them sort of mentally check out. And that can leave us feeling like we're very alone in something that is nevertheless impacting us significantly. 
some of this comes back to expectations. When I've talked to a lot of my clients, one of the things that often comes up is people say, no one told me that this could happen. Now, I can remember when I was being talked, briefed about my double, on, uh, double mastectomy and I'm pretty sure that my wonderful breast surgeon who saved my life, I'm pretty sure that he didn't mention iron bra syndrome. I'm pretty sure he didn't mention that I was going to live with this feeling for the rest of my life. The truth is, even if he had, I still would have had the surgery. I would have said, I don't care what I'm living with for the rest of my life as long as that cancer is gone. But it was about 18 months later after the, after the scars had healed and after, you know, really my body was not too bad. I came to understand that I was living with this thing called iron bra syndrome. And, and part of my struggle was the fact that I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't expect it to happen. I think with peripheral neuropathy, sometimes that can be the, the same and, and lymphedema as well. Um, sometimes, you know, when we're caught up in the diagnosis and the treatment planning, we're so invested in just getting on with it and getting rid of that, that cancer that we don't really understandably give much attention to what might else happen on the other side of it. So the difference between what we might expect and what happens can also contribute to how we respond to the pain. This is a space for empathy, which means, as I say often, go where you're understood. If you've got people in your life who've been through, through something similar or you connect with people through things like the BCNA online network, that can be so valuable in coping with this. And it's also a space for self-advocacy. Sometimes when you might go to your medical team, they might have been fabulous in every other respect, but maybe they're not that great with pain, pain ongoing. Don't stop asking for help. Don't stop looking for answers. I'll talk about exactly what Naveena and Paul have in terms of change versus acceptance a bit further down the track. But while you are dealing with something, you need to feel heard. You need to feel like people are on your side, taking your pain seriously and doing whatever they can to help you manage it the best way you can. The sorts of pain that I see a lot of, uh, my clients talk a lot of, are about nerve and tissue damage as a result of surgery or treatment, peripheral neuropathy, the sort of peripheral neuropathy that doesn't get better after sort of six or nine months, arthralgia, which is that sort of skeletal bone joint aching that often comes with hormone therapy ongoing, and lymphedema. There are other sorts of chronic pain. And honestly, if you've had chronic pain before breast cancer, it usually doesn't go away. And in fact, the, the cancer experience and all that it brings with it psychologically can make it feel like that pain is even worse. So you can kind of apply the principles that we're all talking about tonight to kind of any sort of persistent pain. I mentioned iron bra syndrome. I live with it now. I'm five years down the track. It kind of doesn't bother me. Now, that sounds a bit weird. I can feel this sensation which feels like a steel cable around where my nipples used to be. It goes all the way around my, my chest and around my back. And um, sometimes it feels like somebody's ratcheted it up um, higher. But And there's not when I'm awake, there's not a moment when I don't feel it. But I don't actually identify it as pain anymore. I, I think about it as a sensation. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more. And that brings me to the, the, the overall coping strategy that I'm using here is a thing called psychological flexibility. So when we have pain, we tend to use, um, we, we uh, respond to it as a threat. When we use psychological flexibility, we are using a thing that's based around cognitive, a cognitive behavioural approach, which is the link between our thoughts, feelings and behaviours. So... The three types of psychological flexibility I'm going to talk about are separating pain from fear, the type of language that you might use in your head and with your voice to describe your pain, and getting to know your pain. So first of all, the relationship between pain and fear. That's pretty much what most humans think of, how they respond psychologically to pain. Pain equals threat. And the common threat responses that we have is the thought is pain is bad, the feeling that it brings on is worry, what's going on, and the common behaviour is either avoidance, so I'm going to stay away from the thing that caused the pain, or reassurance seeking, I'm going to go and try and find someone to tell me that everything's going to be okay. If you take away nothing else from my talk tonight, focus on the next two slides, because this is 
the beginning of psychological flexibility around pain. If you think about acute pain as high threat and persistent pain as low threat, you're changing the way that you think about your pain because instead of having only one response where pain equals threat, you're teasing that pain response apart and you're introducing two interpretations for the pain. Is it acute pain or is it persistent pain? If it's acute pain, just like Navina said, a pain spike or a pain event, then that's something to maybe can give consideration to. And it's reasonable then to worry and maybe seek some sort of intervention or help. But if it's the persistent pain, the familiar pain, the pain that you've got to know over what could be months or years, then it's reasonable to interpret it as a, it as a low threat situation. And if you have a low threat situation, you're likely to then respond differently psychologically and behaviourally. The very common response to any threat is to avoid. Your brain goes, that's dangerous, that hurts, I'm going to stay away from that thing. So if movement or anything that you've noticed in your life that, that feels like it's connected to your persistent pain, sometimes that means that we avoid. What Paul and Navina have both highlighted, and I see it all the time in clinic and I know it myself, is that avoidance makes things worse in the persistent pain situation rather than better. If you stop moving, you decondition further, your muscles and your tendons and your ligaments get lax and less strong. They don't support your body to cope with the pain. It's very counterintuitive. Your brain will go, no, this doesn't feel right. But I've tried this. I've got a buggered knee as well as the iron bra syndrome. And I've learned through lots and lots of my own little experiments that if I don't do exercise, my persistent pain gets worse rather than when I do do, ex do, do exercise. It mightn't feel better in the moment. It feels better afterwards. Sometimes it's good to think about what your options are. Very common in avoidance to go, I'm not going to do it, so don't do it. The alternative is do do it, but with persistent pain, you want to also not overdo it. And we call this limit testing. Sometimes it's really important to work out, okay, well, where are my limits? What is enough? What's not, what's not too much? And this takes a bit of trial and error. And again, it is about doing stuff, not avoiding. In your mind, um, thinking about exercise is a strength. It's a, it's a strong, it's a it's a it's a a, um, a forward facing feeling. Pain is very much something that we think about as vulnerability. You know, I feel weak. I feel less than. I feel on the back foot. Whereas exercise makes us feel strong. It's like having a steel rod in your spine. And so mentally, doing things, doing more things, exercise, being mobile, being mobile, being active, is going to make you feel more able to deal with the pain. If you feel like you're going to sit back, not do things, you're actually going to feel more vulnerable and less able to deal with the pain. Language is important with pain because we derive our response to the pain from the meaning we place on it. The word pain has negative associations. So I've started calling, well, several years ago, I've started calling anything that's a persistent pain a sensation. Now, sometimes people will do a bit of an eye roll when I talk about this because it's kind of like they feel like, really? I mean, you know, are you trying to tell me that it's not pain? And I'm definitely not trying to say that it's not pain. But if we keep framing something as that negative connotation, that word pain that we've been socialised around as a threat, then you're going to have that threat response. If you think about it as a sensation, the iron bra thing in my chest is a sensation. The numb feeling in my knee is a sensation. I know it very well. If I have a new feeling, a new acute pain, something that's unfamiliar, then I put the pain label on it. So sometimes playing with this in your mind can be a helpful thing. It might not work for you, but it's probably worth a try. Getting to know your persistent pain. This is very much akin to what Navina was saying about leaning into it. Try and understand your pain. The avoidance model isn't just about like not doing things that make the pain happen. It's also about like I don't want to think about it, I don't want to talk about it. But actually getting to know your pain, understanding like 
what does it feel like? Navina was very descriptive in his in her in her ability to to talk about her pain. I, I could picture it. I could I could kind of understand what she was talking about. You know, with the ants biting that sort of thing. Being able to put language around it is helpful. Understanding through again trial and error and reflection what makes it better, what makes it worse. Is it heat or cold or medication or exercise or rest? When we get to know our pain, and I think my next slide will, yes, we can do a thing called data logging. So data logging is basically keeping track of things by writing stuff down. You could do it on a piece of paper. You can do it um, on an Excel spreadsheet. BCNA have a symptom um, tracker. You can use that as well. These are the sorts of things that I've kept track of and my, my clients keep track of. And it's good to do it for at least a week, possibly even longer. A score out of 10 for your discomfort, where 10 is the most discomfort you could be in, how much sleep you might be getting in that same period, what medication you're on, what your mood score is out of 10, where 10 out of 10 is a fantastic mood and zero out of 10 is awful, and how much exercise you're doing. What's interesting about data logging is not the individual bit of data per day. It's usually the pattern that emerges over time. Whenever I get clients to do data logging, we learn so much more than we ever expect to. And this can be really important because what it gives you is the light and shade in your pain experience. When we talk about pain, we, we often think about it as just it's all awful all the time. But if you come to understand that there are some days or times or situations where your pain score might be or your discomfort score might be a 2 out of 10, and there are other times when it's more like a 7 or an 8 out of 10, what that starts to give you is a range. And it starts to introduce this idea that my pain is not the same all the time. And again, that feeds back to that threat response situation and the psychological flexibility where you can go, okay, is this familiar? Is this different? Is it what I'm used to? Is there something else going on? Is this a better day? Is this a worse day? Sometimes knowing what we say in psychology, you know, you, you don't want a life that's all flat line. You've got to have the highs to know what a low is. And sometimes it's the same with pain. There is this thing called negative attentional bias, which is essentially that we are hardwired as human beings to pay more attention to the negative than the positive. And that really applies to pain. We tend to focus on what I can't do rather than what I can do. So what I say to my clients is let yourself see what you can't do. Look at that as one side of the coin, but then challenge yourself to flip that coin over and ask yourself, yeah, but what can I do? I can't do a whole bunch of stuff I used to do before cancer, but I can still do plenty and I make sure that I focus on that bit of it as well as the times that I think about what I can't do. Novena talked a lot and Paul referenced also the importance of acceptance. When, when people are dealing with persistent pain in the early years, often it's very much around what can I do to fix it or get rid of it. We call that the change model. Eventually, when we come to realise that we've probably exhausted everything that there is to do, we need to then move into the acceptance model. And acceptance can sometimes feel very counterintuitive because it can feel like giving up and it can feel like surrendering and saying, like, I'm, I'm not going to try anymore or I'm accepting that this terrible thing happened. What it's really about is making room for the pain in your life. And if you do that, a whole lot of resistance falls away and you actually cope so much better. Sometimes people say the pain feels worse when I'm tired or stressed. And whilst the pain per se very probably hasn't changed, remember that we all have finite personal resources. You've got a limit on how many cognitive, physical and emotional resources you've got to spend every day. If you're tired and stressed, your brain and body is spending energy coping with that, then those resources are not available to cope with your persistent pain. And that can mean that the pain feels worse. So in summary, we've talked about the fact that persistent pain connected to cancer, but truthfully, any old, any old persistent pain does have a significant psychological and physical impact. And using psychological flexibility is part of the way that we can respond to it more helpfully. Thanks, KP.
Thank you so much, Charlotte, and so many important actions to take out of it. And there is uh, no doubt online people are absolutely talking about starting their logs. So maybe tonight is the time to start their log. And as you said, the team have also put in some connections online around the symptom tracker. Um, but also I think it is just about having a bit of pen and paper next to you and uh, just committing to actually spend some time on being able to understand insights into what's going on and then you can start to see the the trends. Um, so we are on to questions now. So we're going to bring up all three uh, speakers. And Nav, I want to start with you. Um, this, this feeling that's come through um, very much on the live chat around the isolation that comes from pain and this this sense of wanting to take yourself out of life and community because you just you just don't want to face up to it so um what was your experience of that and if someone is online feeling that sense of isolation what would be your advice to them uh, thanks kp got a few things running through my brain from your question. Uh, first one is you're not alone. Absolutely not alone. The number of people who will go through chronic pain is astounding. I mean, the fact that the Victorian government is looking at women's pain um, should give us some idea. Um, and I think this webcast has been highly subscribed as well, which gives you another idea. So you're not alone, but you need to advocate for yourself. Uh, because if you don't speak up about it, people won't know because as um, Charlotte, I think, was talking about invisible pain. You, you you basically judge people based on your eyes. And pain is invisible, so people don't know you're going through it. And the other thing that's that kind of semi-amuses me now is that when you do bring it up, people go, oh, are you still going through that? And it's like, well, yeah, it never stopped. Um, it's just that you stop talking about it because you've gone from whether it's deliberate or not, you've gone from thinking about it as from a pain to a sensation as, as again, Charlotte uh, brought up. Um, I think the other thing too, with a lot of this is guilt. You know, you, people beat themselves up. I, I should have said something. I should have done something. You know, I go, don't beat yourself up. You know, a lot of the times there's nothing you could have done. It's, it's, it's nothing that you physically have, have done yourself as in, uh, voluntarily, this is the stuff. It's the way your body's reacted to whatever's been given to you, and don't beat yourself up because that's your. That, you know, we love beating ourselves up <laughs> as human beings. Um, and the other thing is, I don't know. Ricky at BCNA often says this to me: pain is what the patient says it is. So if you're suffering from pain, you shouldn't have to justify that to anybody else. Like you have pain, so you need to do something about it. Go speak to the doctor. If you don't get an answer from the first one, go to another one, get a referral to another doctor. Whatever you need to do, keep persisting till you get to a point where you can manage your pain because it's mainly about management. Um, find things that make you happy. I, I often call it, you know, find your tribe, find people who make you happy. You know, you don't feel alone. There's other people out there. Uh, who will be supportive, who will love you and be there for you. And if you're not getting that from the people in your life now, go find them. And lastly, uh, KP, I will keep going on about this. And I know it rhymes nicely. Motion is lotion. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. You know, don't stop. Don't run away from it. You just need to, you know, it will be so much worse if you don't move. It will be so much worse if you don't take control and actually do stuff with your life um so that's my uh that's my tips but um they are awesome tips nav and um you know the people in the live discussion were really talking about how just to start slowly often when people um are already feeling guilty about staying on the couch then they go all out and then they they stop so just starting slowly and being kind charlotte i want to pick up on the um the psychological impact and this kind of notion, I know you talk about it a lot in your podcast series, um, 
of the expectations or let's call them well-intentioned family and friends. There was a lot of discussion on the um, forum tonight around how do you actually communicate to your family and friends that this is real uh, and maybe give them some um, insight into what's going on so that they can actually support you as opposed to you feeling like they're judging you or, in fact, maybe eye-rolling at you. Yeah, for sure. Um, It's so tricky uh, and it's a really important issue. I think that um, if we fall into the trap and probably most of us have, of trying to um, persuade other people of of where we're at. It's almost like you, you, you're um, in trouble before you've even begun. Sometimes it can be helpful to have, and this might sound a bit, uh, a bit odd, but to have a conceptual conversation about pain. So to say to somebody, like, what's pain like for you? Like, what do you reckon pain is? Like, what's pain all about? And have a bit of a conversation about it conceptually and, and ask them, have they ever had any pain? Because probably they have and they've probably forgotten. And they might not have had persistent or chronic pain, but even being able to talk about, well, like if they say, yes, actually I have had pain, I had a tennis elbow or I had a car accident or whatever, you can say, God, what was that like? And get them to talk about their pain because then they're coming from their own reference point about pain. And then you can find maybe some common ground or you can highlight the differences. So if they've only had something that was obviously very acute and short-lived, you can go, God, that, that would be awful. What I've got is like really different to that. And then you can bring in your own experience. But if you start off like, if you like a little bit playing to the audience and you're interested in them, you often get a little bit more buy-in and traction than if you just start from the point of view of like, well, I'm going to tell you all about my persistent pain when I already think you're not that interested. And and isn't it true that everyone wants to mostly talk about themselves? So Well, absolutely. absolutely. Yep. Yep. And I, I think being able to allow them to sit in your um shoes is is so important. Um, Paul, can I say I mean, something? Can yeah, I say sure. something, KP, on that? Uh, just in in following on from what Charlotte was saying, um, I think it's a big issue in chronic pain. There's a lot of research about the way families respond to people with chronic pain. It can be helpful, but it can also be unhelpful. It can be what's called overly solicitous and kind of turning the person into a helpless victim, and um, it can be negative and critical. But, you know, I hope it's helpful. For for our pain management program, for whatever the cause of pain is, we actually have a, it's a three-week program and there's a family day at the end of the second week to bring the family in, show them what the person's been able to achieve and also to understand more about it. And there's plenty of resources out there. If you, you can buy books on chronic pain and get them from the library. And New South Wales Department of Health has a website about chronic pain that, we, we know that people around the world access because you know, they've gone back to England or Italy or whatever and told their family and friends, but I, I could forward the link. Yeah. Um, Paul, a question um, online around um, that there's one that we can probably deal with pretty quickly, and that was a question around laser treatment to scar tissue. And does that provide, one, is there any evidence for it? And two, does it actually help with any of the um, pain or sensation as we are now calling it? Um, yeah, like i got to confess I don't really know the answer. Like what I would say is um, it's it's like it would be an alternative to surgery. And I think if you've already got pain from surgery, going in and having another operation is probably going to make the pain worse. Uh, whether whether something less invasive like laser would work, um, yeah, I I'm not familiar with that. It's not something we recommend. But again, it's this, it you know, when by time people, including cancer survivors, get to the pain clinic, they've usually explored a lot of those options, you know, and um, they're generally there because nothing's worked, and so we're, but. Yes, I, you know, it might be the solution for some people. But, yeah, you break scars up. They generally just reform anyway, like with adhesions, you know, after bowel surgery, you go in and release them all and then they just grow back. So 
I it might work for some people, but I don't think it will be a panacea. I think that the, the it is so important for us to make sure that we're going and finding the evidence. And and one of the things BCNA really wants to do is always deliver people mm. with trusted information. Mm. And so, yes, there will often be times when members might tell us, and I think back to the early 2000s when people were saying acupuncture was helping mm. um, them significantly and clinicians rolling their eyes and now here we are with clinicians actually actively telling people to um, find acupuncture so often we can kind of get some intel from um, the lived experience about things that are working for them but from BCNA's perspective it's so important that you look for trusted information and you know all of the facts as you go into that. Paul I want to stay with you if I can mm-hmm. Um, around the dependency on medication and people's fear of staying on medication too long. Is there the right time? Does it vary significantly between the kinds of medication people might be being prescribed? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's a real thing. Um, and that's why the Commonwealth Department of Health and the TGA and so on are restricting access to opioids now, you know, they've got a role for acute pain, like after after an operation or, you know, during that actual treatment of can other treatment of cancer at the end of life. But for for typical persistent pain, you know, the evidence is like they might work at first, but after six or twelve months, and a lot of people, it's like alcohol, you just become tolerant to it, and you've got to have more and more, and then with worse than alcohol, you can really become addicted to them. And there's there's this data from Canada for chronic speaking of evidence for chronic pain in general that if you take like oxycontin or whatever for more than two years you've got like a one in five hundred chance of dying you know like accidental overdose whatever which is like you know so what does that mean that that's like what the risk of dying from COVID was back in when it first got diagnosed when you were under twenty. Uh, under 40, I mean, sorry, under 40 years old. So, you know, it's not like being, it's not like over 70, but it's not, you know, it's people were dying from it who weren't vaccinated. Um, and then, you know, if you're also taking Lyrica or Neurontin, in addition, it doubles your risk. So those those drugs are bad in the long term. Uh, even if you're not addicted in the sense of craving for it, still got a mortality risk associated with long-term use, but it's more they don't work. And it's more also this broader issue, like, um, you know, like Navina was saying at the beginning, it's about moving away from finding someone who's going to do something to take your pain away, whether it's an operation or stick a needle into you or take a pill and like leaning into it and accepting that it's, that the, the issue with it is more that it's interfering with your function rather than it's risking your life and uh, that you can change, like Charlotte was saying, about modifying your behaviour and not being lying down and being fearful but leaning into it and realising you can function despite being pain. And the interesting thing is, again, like following on from what Charlotte was saying, I, you know, I only flashed that, those graphs up for a moment at the end, but... Just by learning pain self-management and this CBT kind of approach, people's pain intensity scores went down. Not not by a lot, but they went down. And it's because that fear and the anxiety component of it is coming out. And they say, yeah, the pain's there, but it doesn't bother me like before, so don't score it 1,000 out of 10 now, or scoring yeah. it 3 or 4 out of 10. Yeah, and I think that goes to that very fact that, we need to look after not just the physical well-being of those people after a diagnosis or those people living with metastatic disease, but we need to actually provide them with the emotional support. Now, I know um, I we're like high on time, but Charlotte, one question that is really coming through the um, the messages is that sense of what people should do if their doctor just doesn't believe them? Um, Get another doctor uh, is the short answer. But before that, because sometimes... um, Sometimes your cancer medical team are, you know, they're your people. Like 
I mean, the people, my oncologist and my surgeon, like they are my guys and it would take a lot for me to walk away from them. And so I would give them some generosity of spirit. I would give them a couple of chances. I would go to them. I would have a separate appointment away from any other treatment or review appointment that I might have. I would make a separate appointment and I would take a support person because you need that kind of like emotional support. And I would have a very short written agenda that might even be in my phone or written on a piece of paper and it might only have one item on it and it might be I feel invalidated because you don't believe me about my pain but if you can't even say those words write it down and slide the piece of paper across the desk you'll get their attention have the difficult conversation that's the first thing sometimes the difficult conversation when it's away from treatment or review appointments can lead to some sort of a breakthrough but if it doesn't, you will know that you've not you've left no stone unturned. If you don't get any change in their behaviour or their belief or their attention to your pain, then it's time to consider someone else. Now, it might be a different oncologist or surgeon. It might be the introduction of a pain specialist. Some of the pain that we're talking about, and, and certainly that sort of pain that Naveen is describing and that Paul treats, is very high level chronic or persistent pain. I have to say, though, there are an awful lot of people who are living with persistent pain at much lower levels where they're not needing that opiate or other types of very serious medical intervention. They might be managing it through things like exercise and some over-the-counter medication and things like um, acupuncture and um, heat and cold. But I think that um, it doesn't mean that that pain isn't very real and very disruptive for them. And it also doesn't mean that they don't need their medical team to acknowledge it. Sometimes their medical team mightn't be able to do much about it, but acknowledging it is really important. You can say to your team, I feel invalidated. You can say those words. You watch their eyes widen when you do. Uh, that is so perfect. Now, Nav, I always like our those with a lived experience who join us to have a final word. What What is the best piece of advice you can leave with people online tonight? <laughs> so, uh... oh, sorry. <laughs> it's totally okay. My apologies. My... Uh... My my bestie, my little canine bestie, has decided uh, um, <laughs> to join the conversation. Um, I I think for me, it's um, it's 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 the whole thing about you know your pain is real. You you know it's this, this thing you know you go. Am I imagining this? Um, you're not, and whatever's pain for you is pain for you, and so. You know, and as Charlotte and Paul said, you know, you feel invalidated if your team doesn't listen to you. So have the tough conversation. Find someone else who listen to you. Um, you have to fight for yourself. And once you've done that, you have to stop fighting the pain. You know, you have to go into accept it. For me, acceptance is the biggest issue. And um, I, I can't remember if it was Paul or Charlotte who said, you feel like you're quitting but you're not. What you're doing is taking control of your life and you're not letting the pain win. Um, and if that's the way you think, if it's like, you know, if you if you have to, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going all over the place, but I feel like it's like, you, you know, you have to do whatever works for you as an individual and how you can get back to some semblance of a life that you want to live. You'll never be the same again. I think people need to like learn to accept that and you just have to learn to find things that make you happy and find things that give your life meaning in a way that um, means something to you. I think that is um, very, very wise words. Um, and I do have a few more updates to give everyone, but I do want to thank uh, Charlotte, Navina, and Paul for giving up your night and your continued support of making sure that we can deliver the very best and most up-to-date information, but really practical support for people. Uh, so there are more resources and support coming up. The next uh, edition of The Beacon, if you're not signed up to The Beacon, it is our magazine that really brings to life the latest in research, 
the advocacy work we're working on and brings to life the stories of those affected by breast cancer to you. Uh, so please call our helpline and sign up for that. Um, we are constantly doing webcasts and we're always up for ideas about how um, we can really find a topic that is like this that resonates with so many of you. So we'd love you to call the helpline and let us know any of your ideas. We're super excited to be heading to Murray Bridge on the 6th of March and Charlotte will be there with us in South Australia too. Then off to Tassie and we know that there are many, many service issues for Tasmanians. So we are heading to Tassie to help support them and provide the latest in information and then Devonport and Hobart and then up to Alice Springs. You will, for many of you, and I saw it in the discussion forum, recognize the voice of Dr. Charlotte Topman. So please make sure that you go online to look at the webcast, what you don't know until you do. And you'll see that Charlotte really looks at a whole series of the emotional challenges that come not from, not just after a breast cancer diagnosis, but with those family, friends, colleagues, and really gives you very practical support about um, how you can lean in and also take some control back in what is a really uncontrollable situation for many people. Um, we have launched and updated a new website, uh, which we're thrilled about, and it's constantly being updated and reviewed. There's an information and resource hub there. I would love you to go online and have a look. And of course, link in to our online network where you can share the experiences of other people. And you'll also link through to the symptom tracker that we've talked quite a bit about tonight. The My Journey is really the place where we can curate information based on the type of breast cancer you have, based on where you live. So the more information you give us, the more we can tailor our information to you. And for many people who participated in our member survey, more than we heard from more than 3,000 of you, really talk, saying to us, we didn't know there was so much more to BCNA. So the My Journey will provide you with that um, place to have tailored information for you. It is so important, like we've touched on tonight, for all of us to look after our emotional well-being. So please know that there are lots of services there uh, to support you. Our helpline, which is open from nine to five on weekdays, uh, making sure you reach out to your GP team. And they, of course, can help you with a mental health plan uh, to help connect into the psychosocial um, services that might be available. If you want to speak to a cancer nurse, then please call the Cancer Council on 13 11 20. And then high distress can happen sometimes when we start to talk to and unravel some of the challenges that we individually face in our lives. So please uh, connect in with Beyond Blue or Lifeline. It has been a complete joy to be with you all tonight. Um, once again, thank you to our speakers to the more than 3,000 of you who signed up to watch this uh, webcast. It will be available on um, in, a, in the next week or so to re-watch or to send. I think a great tip is to send to family and friends so that they can actually hear what the lived experience is and what the health professional specialists are saying. I would like to thank the Australian government who have helped to provide us with funding to provide these webcasts and our information forums right across the country and to our major partners in Baker's Delight, Red Energy, Burley and Suzanne. We are very, very grateful because it is because of them and the generosity of the community that we can continue to serve up the very latest in information and care. So from everyone at BCNA, please take care of yourselves. Please reach out for more information. There is so much more information that you can gather through our website. So please connect in there. Once again, enjoy your evening and thank you for being part of this very powerful network.